Hello again, folks. It is still Strategic Bombing Week, and we have Tony Redding with us in a, uh, to talk about the bombing of Germany. You may remember him from the brilliant Chinditz show he did back in Burma week, and he is the author of this book that I'm heartily recommending, Bombing Germany, The Final Phase. It really is a cracking read, so I, I cannot endorse it enough. So just to remind where we've been this uh, week, this is the furthest into the war we've got on strategic bombing week we were talking about 42 and 43 yesterday in romania we we're talking about 44 we are talking about 1945 today and then tomorrow will also be 1945 but that will be in the pacific with ian w toll talking about the b-29s bombing japan but today it's all about germany so i just i mentioned him but here he is tony redding good evening tony how are you doing yeah i'm good uh nice to be with you again so it's a hot topic because we're going to be mentioning thing places like Dresden, which is a bit of an elephant in the room when it comes up in Twitter debates, one of those endless uh, um, discussions that people have about the merits of it. But we're not just talking about Dresden. We're talking about the bombing of Germany generally in the spring of 1945. Um, so, you, you know, going from Chinditz to Bomber Command, how did your interest in the bomber aspect start? Uh, well, it started because um, a neighbour... Uh, was, uh, as it turned out, um, a rear gunner uh, in a Lancaster bomber. He completed 64 sorties, and uh, um, I'd always um, had in mind to, draw, to, to write a book about Bomber Command, and uh, I offered him the opportunity to collaborate. I didn't hear anything from him for three months. Uh, at the end of three months, uh, he called me out. Uh, he, uh, he made a telephone call to me and said, I'm ready. And basically what he'd done was research his 64 operations and satisfied himself. He had enough to talk about. Wow. Uh, he's, his name is Sidney Knott. He won a distinguished flying cross. And um, about uh, two weeks ago, he celebrated his 100th birthday. So he's still going strong. Brilliant. I mean, that, that's that. it's all about making a contact with the veterans. So we are talking yep. about that bombing campaign in the spring of 45. So, you know, you, to, between us, we've collaborated what we're going to discuss tonight. And I think the first topic, and then we'll use your PowerPoint, is by the spring of 1945, how and why is the UK still committed to bombing Germany? Well, I mean, because the writing's on the wall now. We are we are more certain than we've ever been that we're going to get a victory. So the bombing campaign, what what's what's going on at that point? Well, the whole thing really started in um, July 1940, uh, when, uh, as I'm sure you and the viewers know, um, Britain came very close to a catastrophic um, defeat, uh, and the possibility of invasion was very, very real. And um, uh, in that situation, um, Churchill was desperately looking round for a way in which the war could be successfully prosecuted. And um, he came up with the idea that the only way to meaningfully uh, uh, attack and do damage to Germany was by building a fleet of very heavy bombers. He actually used the phrase um, for um, a devastating, exterminating attack by heavy bombers. So it was always there in, in, in the background. Um, it was there during the war, but really it was only in the second half of um, 1943 and the beginning of 1944, the Bomber Command um, developed the striking power to do um, devastating and exterminating damage. And it was a combination of numbers and technology, and uh, uh, they certainly did uh, uh, devastate um, the, uh, the main cities of Germany. Yeah, and this this came up on our first show on Monday with Don Russell about the B seventeens in forty three. At that in the early stages, as he was talking about, people had been writing about bomber tactics and the future the future use of bombers. You know, in the nineteen thirties, but they had to essentially wait for technology to catch up because we didn't have the capability then. We could talk about talk a good talk, but we didn't have the bombers to, to match up. But by nineteen forty five, as you said, there the technology has caught up with the intention. And, you know, the Bomber Command, I guess, has never been bigger than it was in the spring of 1945. And obviously, we're going to be talking about the heavy bombers a lot. So, you know, we're lots of talking about Lancasters tonight. We had Jane talking about the Halifax bomber a few weeks ago, which is an, the other four engine bomber. But by the spring of 45, uh, it really is the Lancaster is bearing the brunt of everything, isn't it? Yes. Uh, Sir Arthur Harris um, 
the uh, air officer commanding uh, bomber command described it <clears throat> excuse me described it as his shining sword and uh, uh, indeed it was uh, it carried an amazing uh, payload and uh, most people think about the lancasters in terms of bombs and um, here's a mixture of the bombs going right up to 12000 pounds but the, um, the most devastating weapon uh, carried by the Lancasters, uh, you could pick it up very easily in the palm of one hand. It was um, a two kilogram uh, number 15 magne magnesium incendiary and uh, Bomber Command held stocks of them in their millions. And it was really the incendiary that uh, destroyed um, the major cities uh, in Germany. The intention, um, and it wasn't Harris's intention because he only became commander of Bomber Command in February 1942. But before then, the chief of the air staff, um, Peter Portal, um, had a scheme to develop a fleet of 4,000 heavy bombers. Now, that was never within reach. Um, we just didn't have the economy uh, and the industry to produce that. But um, we came to around 2,000 heavy bombers at the end of the war. But of course, if you add the American bomber force to the British bomber force, um, then you come pretty close to 4,000 heavy bombers. So um, it was uh, quite a, a powerful striking arm. In fact, um, uh, Speer, the um, German armaments minister, um, described it after the war as the Allies' third front. Uh, so there was the Eastern Front, the Western Front when D-Day took place, but there was also the third front, uh, front which was the aerial front, and uh, it was extremely effective and very destructive. Which is which is what has led, I guess, to this this endless debate about the merits behind it and of course the 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 impact on civilian casualties we were talking about with luke yesterday about the the, the romanian civilians killed there and you know it will come up and i'll be interested in your views and i'll be interested in the viewers views as well because it's one of those things everyone's got an opinion and we're entitled to think different things and you know i had a cousin who was who was shot down and killed as, as in, in bomber command so i have a family vested interest in it and you know, ultimately, my feeling is when it comes to the air war, wars aren't nice. You know, people people die, and 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 the Allies need to win it. But we will well, continue Ger with that talk. And Goebbels asked the German people if they wanted total war, and the answer was yes. And uh, this was total war. Um, Harris um, described it as the whirlwind, and um, but he wasn't the architect of the whirlwind. It was actually Peter Portal who put the whole thing together and he had a plan for 1943 uh, 44 uh, where a bomber command would drop uh, 1.25 million tons of bombs and uh, it would kill the campaign would kill 900,000 people and would seriously injure another million people it would make 25 million people homeless and destroy a third of um, Germany's war industry so it was um, it was very much a case of total war. Yeah, uh, and and we whether we approve of that or don't approve of it, we're talking about these events. So, uh, folks, um, Tony has provided uh, sixty seven photos in a PowerPoint tonight. So we've got plenty of images to look at. So we'll move through them and then we'll we'll, we'll have various jumping points for conversation. And this is the one that intrigued me right at the beginning of your PowerPoint. So who is this chap? Well, um, I interviewed this chap, um, but he didn't look like that uh, during the interview. His name uh, is uh, Hans Gerstung. Uh, when that picture was taken, um, he was uh, in the Hitler Youth. He was a group leader. He had 10 young boys under his command. He was, I suspect at that point, probably 14 uh, years old. And uh, I interviewed him in his late 70s. And uh, uh, he was um, uh, one of the characters that I want to introduce tonight because uh, one of my aims tonight is to explain what it actually meant to be in a bomb city. Um, when, I, when I chose to write this book, it came from the first book. I mentioned Sidney Knott, the rear gunner. 
Uh, he had a mid-upper gunner who did a second tour in B-17s. They were radio countermeasures, uh, a radio countermeasure squadron. And he mentioned to me on passant that uh, one of the crews, uh, one of the aircraft had been shot down and most of the crew had been murdered. And for a follow-up book, I decided I would investigate the war crime and track down the perpetrators and, and, and write a book about that story and the families who, uh, who were affected by it. And um, uh, during the course of the research, um, I, uh, I have first heard the word Fort Syme. Um, now, uh, I have to confess, um, I, I'd never heard of Fort Syme. Um, just to be clear, it's, uh, it's a town in southern Germany. It's on the northern fringe of the Black Forest. And um, its uh, main claim to fame is that um, it's called Goldstadt. That's its um, nickname. Um, it's the center of the German watchmaking and jewelry industry. And uh, uh, I'd, I'd never heard about, about it. And when I came to investigate the murders, I learned about the raid on Fort Syme, and um, it was um, probably the worst raid if you relate deaths to the size of the city um, than any raid ever, ever carried out in the Second World War, um, with the possible exception of um, Tokyo and, and the gigantic mm -hmm. fire raids at the very, very end. And, and that's why I appreciate you coming on, because when you get to this stage of the war, the impact of Bomber Command, it's all numbers. It's hundreds of aircraft here, hundreds of tons, thousands of tons of bombs. Yeah. It's all about miles of cities being eroded, you know, erased. And actually, that's difficult to take in. It's like the Holocaust. You can't take in 11 million being killed, but you can kind of take on board individual stories. That's why the Schindler's List film was so powerful, because it, it, it yeah. presented that story from a personal point of view. And I think talking about... This, this, these raids from the point of view of some of the crews, and also I really appreciate talking about it from the German point of view as well. I think we're going to get a nice balanced uh, view of what was happening here. So um, yeah, all this is going to go. I, I mean, it was always the idea that this account would be balanced and it would be even-handed, uh, not judgmental. Um, but having said that, um, I want to get across uh, in this talk um, the type of life that ordinary German people had to live uh, under the criminal uh, Nazi uh, regime. But to give you some uh, early um, indication of the magnitude of, of the Fort Syme raid, it took place about 12 weeks before the end of the war. 83% um, of the urban area was destroyed and a quarter of the town population, 17,000 people, died that night. And uh, many of them um, were never found. They, they simply vanished. They turned to ash and, and vanished. So it was a um, horrific and uh, very significant event. Um, many of the attempts to tell the story about Fort Time in the past have suggested it was a completely innocent um, city and it was laid waste um, without good cause. And... Uh, it was essentially uh, a war crime. Well, um, people will have to judge for themselves um, at the end of this uh, broadcast just how innocent it was. But I will say immediately from the first, it's very difficult to tell the guilty from the innocent when you're in a high-flying bomber on a dark night. Um, it just can't. It can't be done. I mean, that's an obvious, an obvious. Thing. Yeah. And, and whatever we think about the merits of bombing, we always must respect, pay our respects to those who are, you know, called up into service or volunteer and end up in bomber command or in the 8th Air Force or 15th Air Force. They're just doing their job like everybody is doing their job in the war effort and, and no judgment can ever be passed or should ever be passed on individual crews doing their job. It's just, if there is um, analysing to be done, it's of the higher level strategy of what was going on behind the scenes, but our respect for the air crews will always be where it should be, which is they were doing their jobs like everybody was doing. So, well, well, um, maybe, maybe we should talk a bit about that job at that time. Yeah. Um, the, the, the raid against Forsyth um, took place on February the 23rd, 1945, and there are many reasons for the raid, but the, the key thing to remember here is 
that the Allies were perfectly prepared to use air power to crush and demolish anything that was in the way of the advance of their armies. And there were two priorities in this campaign. The first one were the oil plants, and the second one was communications, especially the rail yards. And the idea was to paralyze movement, uh, the movement of troops and supplies. And Fort Syme uh, was on the line between Karlsruhe and Stuttgart. It's about halfway between the two cities. And it also stood in the path of the French advance um, from Alsace. And um, uh, it's ironic, but the fact is this terrible raid brought death to a lot of people. But ironically, it, it also liberated um, the city, uh, as did the uh, Western Allies um, when they occupied um, the rest of the Western half of, of Germany. It's important to say that the Allies didn't see themselves as liberators in this context. Uh, they were conquerors. But the reality is that they, they were liberators. And I think when you come to understand um, the ghastly way that um, the Nazi uh, regime treated their own citizens, you'll begin to appreciate why it was a liberation. Because not Nazi Germany, life in Nazi Germany, was run by, um, well, intimidation um, from thugs, gangsters and opportunists. And uh, the whole thing was held together by a dreadful fear of denunciation. And uh, it was a terrible regime to live under. And it's only when you actually talk to people, you talk to the survivors, and not only ask them about the rape, but ask them about the circumstances in which they actually live, that you begin to appreciate uh, what life uh, in, in Nazi Germany was actually like for, for ordinary people, you know, people like you and me. Yeah. And at this point in the war, it's been said in so many World War II TV shows, as as the war is getting towards a close, it's the, to an end, the, the Germans are becoming, they're the wounded animal now, aren't they? It's that the, an animal is never more dangerous than when it's been wounded and it knows it's going to die. And I think at that point, you know, when we look at the, the fanaticism of the SS in Berlin and things like that, we realize that, that or the war may be about to be over, but that, that the beast that we're fighting is is going through its its absolute last attempts to kill as many allies as it can. And uh the, and Goebbels is still heavy with his propaganda about the Yabos and the terror bombing, and so it, it, it's there's a lot going on in this part in the spring of '45, and I think it's an it, overlooked chapter. It's interesting the time issue because the raid only took took place only a matter of um, weeks before the end of the war, but it also took place um, only a matter of weeks after the Germans Ardennes offensive, uh, the Battle of the Bulge, and the attempt to um, uh, split um, uh, the Western Allies in half and, and, and reach the um, critical point of Antwerp. Um, so it's very easy to be wise after the event and mm. say, well, I mean, you know, the war ended uh, on uh, May the 8th, uh, 1945. Well, we know that, uh, but people in uh, February 1945 didn't know that, and they didn't know what else, perhaps, uh, Hitler's regime had in store. So um, it's easy to be judgmental um, when you're smart um, after the uh, uh, after the event. But Fortsheim itself you know, was an obvious candidate. Um, it um, this particular raid happened ten days after the attack of Dresden, and um, it was obvious what was coming. Um, <laughs> the town had 300 air raid warnings in 1944, and it did have a few bombs here and there, but basically it was still intact. Um, but it was busy, instead of making jewellery and watches, it was making fuses and timers for munitions, and it had quite a substantial rail marshalling yard, and it was in a crucial um, sector of the front, and um, Karlsruhe and uh, Stuttgart had been very heavily bombed and um, Bomber Command was now running out of big city targets. So they started attacking small, smaller um, cities and towns and um, 
they now had a big enough fleet of heavy bombers that they could attack two or three targets uh, on the same night and pretty much drench them uh, with bombs. To give you some idea, uh, the bombing uh, increased dramatically. Uh, if you take from the beginning of the war in 1939 to July 1944, uh, Bomber Command dropped about 492,000 tonnes of bombs. But in the last nine months, um, it almost doubled this total to 955,000 tonnes. So it was a huge escalation in, in bombing violence, um, but it was there um, for an end. And, and the end was to bring the war to a finish as quickly as possible. Nobody really knows, but it's estimated that between 40 and 60,000 people were dying every day. And um, uh, not only to the end of the war, um, also um, in the immediate weeks after the end of the war, there was a continued huge loss of, of, of life. And the imperative was to, to bring this all to a stop and um, nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the advancing uh, Allied armies. And um, that's the explanation for the escalation. Yeah, and I think, and, and we have to remember what Eisenhower and uh, and Churchill and, and the FDR, all those figures said that you know it's, that there's no let up until it's over. You know, there's, there's, it's, this is, this is, you know, this complete victory or nothing, and uh, you can't let your foot off the gas <laughs> at this point. Now it's all about steaming ahead to get that victory. But um, we had this image of the of the crew there, so I'm intrigued who the who these who this crew is. Well, this is uh, one of the crews on 550 Squadron. I happen to concentrate on this particular squadron. Uh, and they contributed um, over 20 aircraft for the fourth time uh, uh, raid. And um, a very typical uh, uh, crew. Uh, and um, uh, the losses um, in Bomber Command were actually much reduced in the last six or seven months of the war. But they were really um, still uh, quite. Um, severe. Um, I'll give you one example. Two days um, before the Fort Sam raid was flown on the 23rd of February, uh, 45, um, the uh, Luftwaffe's uh, top night fighter race, uh, Major Schnaufer, um, uh, he logged nine kills in one day. Uh, he shot down two uh, uh, in, in, in the early morning. Uh, had a rest during the day, uh, went off in the evening and shot down seven more. So nine, uh, seven in each bomber. So um, there's a lot of people there. And uh, in fact, he was so successful that um, his night fighter was used as a war trophy and it was taken over to Hyde Park at the end of the war. And um, they displayed uh, the thing in Hyde Park and uh, he uh, had uh, well over 100 victories. And in fact, if anybody's interested, you can still see the tail fin in the Imperial War Museum with all the randoms on. It's uh, quite something. So uh, although um, um, this particular crew and other crews um, had less chance of being shot down at this period of the bombing campaign, it was still a very run risk. And sometimes the casualties were really quite high. Yeah, and we'll we'll move through some of these Im incredible images you sent because you've got a couple of aerial photos here. So what are we looking at here, Tony? Well, yeah, I think um, this isn't a raid on Germany. Um, this is um, a, a raid, I think, on France. It says Calais um, in the bottom corner there, so yeah. That's a bit of a clue, I guess. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so um, one of the interesting things about it is that some of these raids were taken, taken at fairly low level sometimes at a, a, a level that was actually quite uncomfortable for the crews. Uh, if you dropped a, a 4,000 pounder, 2,000 kilo blockbuster bomb, high explosive bomb, um, you didn't really want to get any lower than 5,000 feet when it went off. So uh, quite a dangerous thing to do, really. Uh, same thing there. It's a, a, a river uh, industrial target in, in France. Yes. <laughs> This is um, uh, uh, a very important photograph for me. Um, I met a remarkable woman in, in Fort Sun, uh, a raid survivor, and uh, <clears throat> her name is Ellen Obeil, and uh, she was seven years old, I think, when this photograph uh, was taken. 
when I met her, um, she was a retired um, uh, uh, criminal um, detective. In fact, she was, I think, the first female criminal uh, detective in this part of, uh, or in southern Germany. And uh, uh, she uh, uh, was very kind enough to give me uh, quite a lot of assistance um, in my visits to the town of, of Fordside. And she took part in a number of uh, public readings and uh, was uh, a, a very interested and strong-willed uh, lady. Well, this photograph, uh, this is the Phantom of the Ruhr, <laughs> as you can see from the, uh, <clears throat> from the nose art. And you can see also the little omelettes. Um, I think there might be a couple of ice cream cones there, which uh, suggests she might have made one or two trips to, uh, to Italy. Um, but um, she made over 100 missions um, uh, and survived. I interviewed somebody who suffered the uh, ignominy, uh, the uh, <laughs> disgrace, I suppose, of, uh, of running off the runway with it. Uh, it was a very precious aircraft, but that's Phantom of the Ruhr. Uh, this is Major Schnaufer, and um, you can see he and his crews, uh, his two crew, um, all wearing the uh, the Knight's Cross, and um, a very uh, a very good looking and skillful night fighter pilot, quite exceptional. He was debriefed after the war, and he said that ninety eight percent of his targets uh, that he engaged uh, went down as flamers. So they were burning uh, when they wow. went down. Ironically, um, he <laughs> it's a real tragedy, but uh, ironically, after the war, he was killed in France when he was on holiday. He was driving in a car and uh, a French truck driver hit him. So I think that was in 1953. So um, he didn't have much time to enjoy the peace, really, but uh, uh, a serious hero. Uh, well, this is what happens when you get hit by somebody like Major Schnaufer. Um, I think this aircraft um, ended up uh, over the border in Switzerland, uh, but you can see the state of it. And um, I think in this case, there were some bodies in front of the wreckage, but um, I didn't use the uh, whole, mm. whole photograph. But you can see the state of the rear turret, and uh, that's a Junkers 88. Um, I can't remember which mark. Um, but um, that's a real killing machine. It's uh, loaded with uh, radon technology and uh, um, a very heavy battery of cannon and uh, machine guns. I seem to remember, uh, I was told, I can't remember by who, but uh, have you ever heard of the um, the make of um, Radio Blaupunkt? You know I don't that? think so, no. Uh, uh, the guy who... Uh, uh, invented that uh, was a night fighter radar operator. I was once told, but anyway, ah. uh, let's move on. Well, yeah, um, uh, this is a, another uh, indication of uh, damage. Um, as you can see, um, uh, if in an approach from behind, <coughs> excuse me, uh, attacking a bomber, quite often, um, if you weren't coming up from underneath with upward firing cannons. Uh, uh, if you're coming in from behind, um, the first thing you do will be to try and knock out the rear tire for obvious reasons. And uh, you can see that uh, there is a great deal left of that. Mm. Well, this aircraft landed. Um, you're testing my memory here sometimes since I've been through these photographs. But if you, um, if you look at the state of the prop there, um, I seem to remember that this aircraft uh, actually um, uh, settled onto another aircraft underneath it. Um, so there was a sort of a glancing mid-air collision, uh, but it actually uh, made it back. Um, but um, in quite a state, I expect that at least two of the engines were feathered um, mm. on the way back. But um, amazing that it survived. Well, we're going to we'll move up to, to actual, towards the radio itself, but I think of your photo, this is the one that intrigued me when you sent me the PowerPoint. Yeah, this was, um, uh, this was part of um, an incendiary, and, uh, and it was uh, uh, 
going to be dropped during a raid on the, the lunar works. Where it's actually uh, lunarists so incorrectly there, but 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 never mind. The story behind it was that um, uh, it doesn't belong to, uh, or it didn't belong to um, its long-standing owner. Uh, basically, one of the risks when you're flying a very dense attack on a, on a city or an industrial target is that you could end up flying into the bomb load of the aircraft above you. And uh, in fact, this aircraft um, flew into a cloud of incendiaries. And I think um, it ended up um, with uh, 60 incendiaries inside it, uh, including this one. And um, I think it was a mid-upper gunner. He tried to put the damn thing out and it refused to be extinguished. And uh, First of all, he couldn't reach it because it was in the wing room and he took an axe to the structure and managed to get the thing out and get it on the floor. And, uh, but um, he couldn't put it out and eventually he had some help and, and they did put it out. And, uh, he kept it for the next 50 years as a doorstop. So, wow. yeah. so, so somebody, let's, let's talk okay. about uh, Forzheim. So what was the morale? Yeah, I've got, you, you, know, you gave me your bullet points of what you want to talk about. So, so we've got... The morale of the Allied pilots at this point is that they must be feeling that the war is kind of coming to an end. What about mm. the people of, of southern Germany? What are they feeling in the spring of 45? And, and, you know, and Dresden, as you said, Dresden has happened a few days earlier. For, in your interviews with the people on the ground there, what was morale like? Well, I think the answer is that uh, morale never collapsed, <clears throat> as it never collapsed um, in, in, in Britain. But they, it was certainly beginning to crack. And um, uh, uh, there's a gentleman called Adolf Katz. He was the manager of Deutsche Bank in Fortside. And uh, he kept um, an amazing diary. And uh, he put all the secret things in there which have got him, would have got him locked up or worse if anybody had ever found, found it. Um, but he, was, he noticed how even strong Nazi supporters um, at the New Year, 1945, we're now talking about how hopeless the, uh, the situation uh, was. And um, it was obvious that there was going to be a major attack, uh, air attack um, on the city of Fortside. And it was also um, obvious that they were going to be occupied. And, uh, but to give you some idea of the desperation of the um, Nazis at this time, uh, I met a man called Hans Ard, and uh, in 1945, he was nine years old. He was too, actually too young to join the Hitler Youth, um, but um, he wasn't too young to be taught how to fire a Panzerfaust anti-tank rocket. And at school, they taught him how to fire a Panzerfaust. And they also let him fire a, a light machine gun. Uh, being nine years old, he was hugely proud of this uh, privilege and uh, he was then given a pair of binoculars and told to stand outside and watch for enemy aircraft. He was nine years old. Um, his sister, um, uh, considerably older, um, came home from school once lunch one lunchtime and told her mother who was making lunch um, that German soldiers, when uh, uh, when they uh, when they die on the battlefield, um, they uh, they died with a smile on their face. And uh, her mother said, why don't you stop talking that bullshit? And uh, the daughter then turned to her and said, well, um, I'll denounce you for that. And uh, you'll end up in a, a, a concentration camp. So the mother had had enough at that point. So she picked up the potato salad, opened a window and threw it into the courtyard. So, uh, so the girl got, got no lunch. But it kind of gives you an idea how uh, that family were affected by the situation. A nine-year-old is taught to fire an anti-tank rocket, and uh, and the girl is told that um, you know you end up smiling when you're dying on the battlefield. That's that's the sort of enemy that we were fighting against. No yeah. scruples, no scruples at all. Which is why, in some ways, it's hard to judge what their morale is like because you, in the, under the Third Reich, you get punished for saying negative things. As you say, you can be denounced for grumbling about the railway lines or you grumble about the, 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 the fact there's no food. So if, if you're forced to give a positive idea about everything, you can't really judge the morale. I mean, 
in Britain, well, even yeah. when we were facing the Blitz, it was still the British right to grumble. We could grumble about Churchill. We could grumble about whatever he wanted to grumble about. So in Germany, at that point, it's hard to really gauge um, what the truth was because, you know, of, of the, 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 the way the regime is operating. Well, believe it or not, you could be shot for grumbling. Um, yeah. but we'll, we'll, we'll get on to that um, later on. So, um, yeah, just to give you an idea of the priority um, targets and what it meant, um, I mentioned oil plants and rail yards. Um, on December the 4th and 5th, that, that night, uh, Karlsruhe's rail yards were bombed and um, the glow was visible from 100 miles away yeah, in, in the air. Um, now, the rail link between Karlsruhe and Stuttgart was really getting quite important. And um, uh, the writing really was on the wall. Um, 300 Lancasters attacked uh, a small town called Hilbron, uh, it's northeast of Forsyth, um, and over 7,000 people would die, uh, died. It was a fast attack. And uh, I interviewed a guy called Dave Davidson, he was a Lancaster captain, and um, uh, he flew on raids like that. And he also um, flew against a synthetic oil plant. And he said he'd never seen such concentrated flak. It was a solid floor of, of flak over the target. So for the first and only time, he told his crew, um, clip on your parachutes. Uh, if we get hit, jump. Don't, don't wait for my order to abandon. You, as far as I'm concerned, you can jump. And uh, that gives you some idea of the ferocity of how some of these um, targets were, were defended. But the fact that the world, the fact is that the whirlwind did arrive, and uh, by December 1944, 80% uh, of German um, cities were devastated. And uh, but of course, that left 20 percent that became more conspicuous by the fact that the others have been destroyed. And, and those um, that were increasingly uh, conspicuous were the cities, included the cities in the east. And uh, uh, certainly um, Dresden and Chemnitz were, um, were very prominent there. They got a reprieve in January 1945 because the weather was so atrocious in eastern India. There was fog, snow. And a lot of the planned raids were never flown. They were, they were aborted because of the weather uh, conditions. But uh, the banker, Adolf Katz, uh, he, he knew it was a juicy target. He actually wrote in his diary that he knew that 25 to 30 million worth of munitions was held up in Fort Science rail yards um, because it couldn't be moved because of constant fight bomber attacks. So, I mean, it was a sitting duck, really. So, so we have a situation where Forzheim is one of the 20% of cities that hasn't been hit. It's on an important rail work network. There's there's supplies here there that can't be got out because of dive bombing. So it's it's just going to happen. So how big was the raid in terms of numbers for the RAF and, and how was it put together? Well, in terms of um, um, the, the big set piece raids on cities like Cologne, Berlin, Hamburg, Dresden, it wasn't that big. Um, it involved 362 Lancasters and 13 Mosquitoes. Um, but, uh, and it's a big but, um, it was unusual in some ways. First of all, the, the crews were really surprised to be briefed to make the attack from between five and 11,000 feet because that's extremely low mm. and worried a lot of them. But the second thing that bothered them was that nobody had ever heard of Fort Side. Where's Fort Side? They were used to going to Essen, they were used to going to Duisburg, but Fort Side, nobody had ever heard of the place. And um, there was a little bit of um, concern um, about that. And uh, uh, nobody knew where the place was, nobody knew anything about it, and they had to be briefed and they had to be told. Uh, why this road uh, was taking place. Actually, I, I'm going to stop or pause for a second and talk about this uh, photograph. Um, uh, one of the people I interviewed, um, his mother is one, two, three, I think it's three up on the left hand, hand side. Uh, that one? 
I think it's I think it is it's that one. Um, these are um, uh, German housewives who are part of the Air Defence Auxiliary, and um, it was a picture taken um, uh, during uh, their program. And, uh, everybody was expected to take their their share of the burden in that. But of course, that's no different from uh, in the UK. I mean, there were lots of women who were engaged in fire watching and uh, joined the uh, auxiliary fire service and so on and so forth. But I think particularly uh, unusual um, about that. Um, but um, certainly uh, it was a surprise for the air crews going back to Fort Sime Ray um, to be targeted uh, at, uh, at, at that city. And uh, we can perhaps talk about, I don't do want to talk about Dresden before we get on. To, um, uh, I think to, if, uh, if you think it connects to the subject importantly, let's talk about Dresden, yeah. Well, I think it does, and it, it does for the simple reason that um, Dresden, like Fordsheim, is portrayed as an innocent uh, uh, city that uh, is almost an open city. Uh, you know, there's, there's no reason to bomb it other than to cause extreme terror. I'm not suggesting for one moment that um, the terror aspect can be completely ignored because, you know, that relates to morale. It relates to disruption of the enemy war effort, and it relates to the ability for the Russians to 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 take that part of uh, of, of Eastern Germany. But um, the truth about Dresden is that very very few people uh, have any interest in telling the truth about Dresden. And um, the truth is, for example, that Harris. Uh, frankly, had nothing to do with the decision to attack the city. Um, all those decisions were taken by heads of government at Yalta. And um, truth also is that there was plenty of war industry around Dresden. Um, I've read an account of a 15-year-old girl, uh, a Jewish girl, who was a slave labourer in an aircraft factory uh, in the local area. There was the huge um, optics uh, complex in the area. There were plenty of reasons for bombing Dresden. One is that it was the centre of war production. Um, and actually, the city itself, the city authorities boasted about that in 1942. And um, I, I, I've read the text of, 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 of that declaration, that boast. Uh, Dresden uh, was very large. It was undamaged. And it was a control center for that part of the Eastern Front. Uh, it was a uh, transport hub and um, uh, there was every reason to bomb it. But equally, uh, that's not to say that it, the result was not horrific. It, it was. I mentioned Dave Davison, the Lancaster captain um, I, I interviewed. He, uh, he flew on that raid and uh, he saw it. He saw the glow above the city. Um, hundreds of miles ahead, and he, he asked his navigator to confirm that is, is that on track for Dresden. Um, the, navig the navigator said yes, but it's impossible because Dresden is still two hours away. Uh, but the globe um, was, was Dresden, and it was from the first wave attack. And, wow. uh, he was in the second wave, which was twice as big as the first wave, and uh, over 40,000 40, people died. But um, when you come down to brass tacks, and uh, that isn't Dresden, by the way, I think it's Berlin. Uh, but um, when you when you talk about Dresden and the reason for it, um, you can argue forever. I mean, it's been interpreted, it's been reinterpreted, it's been misinterpreted by people of of all persuasions. But the fact is that um, it was a legitimate war target. Uh, at, at that point. Uh, then the very day after Bomber Command attacked Chemnitz, which was another one of the cities that the Russians wanted uh, to be bombed by uh, Bomber, Com Bomber Command and, and, and the Americans. And um, that took place the very next day. And the city's rail yards were, were the target. And um, to give you some idea of the background to it, um, there was a huge compound um, in the city greater area and it contained 4,000 political prisoners 
and only a day or so before the men it was men and women but the men were told to start digging uh, a huge pit for a reservoir well it, it wasn't a reservoir it was going to be their mass grave the authorities in dresden had ordered that all four thousand should be executed and um the fact is that um raiding uh, dresden raiding chemnitz uh, saved their lives because the executions were cancelled in the wake of the uh, of the two uh, of the two raids simply because everybody else had uh, other things to think about at that point so you have to get the whole thing into context but it's hard to arrive at the balance the fact of the matter is in all of these conversations it's really quite simple if it's if it's your father who died in the raid what do you care about anybody else or what do you care about the strategic context of of it the fact is you've lost your father but you might have lost the rest of your family as well and i've got some um i've got something to say about that a bit later on so um it doesn't help in the personal context obviously. no and, and as martin hardy says there that you know dresden is used to beat bomber harris with a stick and the thing is when you have when when a, when, a, when dresden comes up on twitter or facebook or internet forums a lot of the people contributing to the arguments haven't read anything about it. They don't know much about it other than what other people have told them to believe. They've either told them to believe it was a war crime or it was not a war crime. And the two sides, if you like, in the argument just kind of butt heads in the middle of this. And, and the fact the facts get get overlooked. So um, that's the thing with Dresden is, yeah. is that it's a, it's a lost cause in a sense. Dresden is going to be one of those hot, hot potato topics that people are going to throw around forever now. So... Let, let's get back to four zone. Let's get back to what we're yeah. talking about and um, okay. well, I mean, team and okay. accept the fact that these are legitimate um, targets. But I need to tell you something about four zone. The first thing is, uh, by the way, that's a uh, plan of the um, city. It sits in a bowl. Um, so there's high ground all around it and it's roughly elliptical in shape. And all the dark areas are the areas that were destroyed in the uh, in that in that bombing raid. And um, I can tell you about Fort Sign, the fact that it was always known as browner than most. And what that means is that Hitler got a bigger share of the vote in Fort Sign than he did in a, an awful lot of other cities. Um, it was uh, quite enthusiastic for the Nazi cause uh, in the early 1930s. Um, uh, Jewish stores uh, were picketed uh, in, in the 1930s, and um, women who insisted on uh, continuing to, to shop at Jewish stores, they were photographed and their photos were displayed um, very, very large on cinema screens that evening with abusive captions and, and, and comments. Wow. Uh, during the war years, um, schoolgirls lectures uh, from uh, Nazi uh, uh, leaders to volunteer for Lebensborn, uh, the, uh, the Aryan uh, breeding uh, program, although um, the uh, one of the ladies I spoke to said she didn't see many volunteers for it, they were particularly keen on that. Um, there were 700 French forced labourers working in the uh, factories, mostly the small workshops. Uh, making fuses and timers uh, in full time and uh, they, they were looking forward to uh, a raid and, and, and the end of, end of the war but it was too late for Fort Symes Jews uh, 195 um, Jews uh, were rounded up in October 1940 uh, they were given one hour uh, and allowed to pack one small suitcase and report to the freight terminal in Fort Symes and uh, they were taken away in six boxcars. Um, they were taken to Gers camp in the Pyrenees. Um, a lot of them died there through um, uh, malnourishment and, um, and disease. And the rest of them were, <coughs> excuse me, were shipped east in uh, 1942. They were murdered in, um, in, in the camps. Uh, mostly I think in I'm glad you mentioned that, Tony, because I think setting the scene of the fact that this is a town that had predominantly voted for hitler they they they've got forced workers living there they are behind the, the nazi effort they've 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 given up their jews 
it, it, it's all the important context we need to understand before we start labeling, using labels like victims and terror bombing. It, it, this is all important context to understand what was going on. So, but going back to the radio itself, we said it was exceptionally low, 5,000 to 11,000 feet. What was the rationale for bombing it at that altitude? Um, well, accuracy and to, um, to hit and destroy the rail yards. And uh, it was a perfect night for marking. And uh, this is a very, very uh, important picture. I'll come to that in a second if you keep it on the screen. Uh, but it was a perfect night for marking, um, brilliant moonlight. And um, uh, the city really was uh, a sitting duck. Um, this is a still um, from a film that is usually used to portray the destruction of uh, Dresden, but it isn't. It's actually Fort Sign. Uh, one of the Lancasters on the Fort Sign raid was a Crown Film Unit um, aircraft. And um, you can always tell if it's Fort Sign because if you watch the film clip and you look in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see a Lancaster suddenly appear and track um, uh, right up the, uh, the, the frame. And that is definitely, uh, definitely uh, uh, the fourth time, uh, the fourth time uh, raid. I wanted to just go back about fourth time itself, the, the city. Um, uh, it was the raid came too late to save um, Nora. That's uh, Nora Inyat Khan, the British agent. Um, she was chained uh, hand and foot and starved in Fort Sign prison, and then she was beaten to death by a sadist in Dachau. It was too late for 70 French resistance fighters. They were killed by a Strasbourg Gestapo in November 44 in what they called the Black Forest Blood Week. Uh, they included 25 prisoners held in Portsmouth uh, jail, and they were shot in the neck on the rim of a bomb, bomb crater. So um, this gives you some sort of context, but the whole thing came to a head for Fortsheim. Um uh, on the 22nd of February uh, 1945, when a photo reconnaissance plane uh, flew over the city and found that the rail yards were still functioning, and that meant that the uh, that the raid was on. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned um, uh, uh, yeah. the, the prison there because it just today I received uh, uh, Kate Viger's book Mission France, and um, uh, and Noor Yar Khan is in there, the story of the prison there. So. Uh, Connects it with the SOE shows you the other week, and I'd forgotten that was the prison where she was kept. So um, yeah. yeah, thanks for reminding me of that. But yeah, so so low low level accuracy, um, every, everything everything about the raid from the RAF point of view went reasonably well. Well, uh, I mean, when when the aircraft were first tracked uh, by German air defence, um, they thought the raid was going to Stuttgart, um, but then the Christmas tree flares um, burst over the city of Fortsheim and. The sirens went at 1945 hours, and um, um, then the, the the raid began. It began five minutes after the uh, flares uh, burst, and uh, within the space of ten minutes, um, the firestorm developed, and the surface fires uh, merged and sucked in um, the air. Uh, it needed oxygen, and uh, created the firestorm uh, hurricane. Hundreds of thousands of incendiaries uh, were dropped, and um, uh, I think it might be helpful if, if I gave you a, um, a true picture of what it was actually like on the ground. Um, thousands of people were gassed in the, in their cellar uh, shelters. The temperatures reached sixteen hundred degrees centigrade. Uh, thousands of the dead uh, turned to ash. Uh, Ninety percent of the buildings were on fire. And the structures uh, collapsed because the fires were hot enough to melt um, steel beams. And uh, women caught outside suffered particularly because their legs were exposed and they began to burn. Um, some uh, desperately sought shelter from the blizzard of firestorm uh, sparks. But the narrow streets, there are some very narrow streets in Fort Zimmer, they became sort of canyons of fire, really. And, uh, the doctors, some doctors managed to start working in underground shelters and they were treating people that had smoke poisoning, um, eye damage, uh, burns, obviously, 
um, broken limbs. And uh, there are three rivers that run through uh, the city of Forsyth, and a lot of people save themselves by jumping in the rivers. And some of them have no choice because they had terrible phosphorus burns. I spoke. Um, uh, no, I didn't speak to this particular person, but I read the account. So, a 22 year old, old girl, um, she was a very young girl, in a doorway, and she heard a man next to her say, She's burning. And then suddenly she realized that she he was talking about her. She was burning. And uh, uh, she ended up uh, jumping into a river to, uh, to save herself. A lot of people struggled brief um, as the fires consumed all the oxygen and it was particularly difficult to escape because I mentioned that Fort Syme is in a low low area, a bowl in effect. Um, to get anywhere to escape um, you had to climb uphill uh, which made it of course uh, even more difficult. Do you remember the first photo you showed was of uh, a young boy, um, Hans yep. Gerstein, um, the uh, Hitler Youth uh, uh, leader. Uh, he was uh, an air raid runner and he tried to get to his post and, uh, as he was struggling to get there because things were collapsing all around him. He, um, he heard this um, screaming and shouting and um, a woman was trying to get him to come over and help her pull people out of a butcher's cellar that was on fire. And there was a, a loading chute and uh, um, he managed to pull a few people out of there. And then suddenly somebody hit him on the shoulder and he turned around and there was a, a mother with a, with a, a young baby wrapped in, a, wrapped in a blanket. And she begged him uh, to help her. And uh, he knew exactly where he was. He was only um, several hundred metres away from his home. And he knew that there was, um, there was a big private house, a wealthy family, they had a very large garden. He thought if we could get into the garden, then we'll be safe from collapsing um, buildings and, and, and debris. Uh, and as he was making some progress with a uh, suddenly uh, a large chunk of masonry hit him on the head. And uh, <laughs> he, he, he obviously lost consciousness when he woke up. Uh, he was in a long line of dead people. Um, uh, basically, somebody had picked him up and decided that he was finished and uh, put him in a line and uh, he, uh, he looked over the road and uh, that was his front door and uh, he got over to the front door and his mother and family saw him and screamed because he uh, he had a tin helmet on, a steel helmet on and uh, the, the masonry had bashed the steel helmet and the rim had gone right into his forehead and he was covered in blood and uh, <laughs> he told me when I interviewed him, I've still got the scar look, he said, but you can't see it now because it's covered in wrinkles. You know, but um, he, he actually showed me um, the places where he put the people out of the cellar and um, approximately where he'd, um, he'd been hit on the head. Um, but there is a photograph somewhere uh, on, on, the, uh, uh, on the PowerPoint. Uh, uh, where uh, it all actually took place and, and where that, that one? Yes, that's the, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, now not a butcher's, but it was at the time. And uh, maybe the next one shows, uh, I don't know, Let's see what the next, yes. If you look at this photograph, um, this is approximately where he got hit on the head. And if you look straight ahead at the very end, there's some bollards. Can you see them there? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. If you look at those bollards, that's where the line of dead people were. And if you go to that corner on the left-hand side or approximately the, the centre of the photograph, um, that building on the um, first floor was where the family lived. So um, that's, that's where it happened. Yep. And I'm glad, you know, I'm glad we're talking about the casualties, the casualties and the civilian experience because, as I expected, the sidebar of conversations is talking about. There's the conversation about it. If we're bombing railway lines, why are we using incendiaries? It's it's all about bomber Harris and Churchill and people are talking about, it, and that's fine. It, they're all healthy discussions. they everyone's being very polite about it. But at the end of the day, that's all going to be down to opinion. What we what isn't down to opinion is the fact you have spoken to these these civilians and you've got their experiences. And I think that's what's so.
refreshing about what you're telling us. It's about you're not judging anybody. You're not saying you're just saying here's what happened on the ground. I think that's important history. So yeah. um, we'll we'll keep on going for your PowerPoint. Jump in with yeah. the comments about the um, the people you've spoken to and the impact because obviously you know the impact to the people on the ground. It wasn't just on the on the day. It was over the next few weeks and months. We'll talk about that as we carry on with the show. Yeah. So. I think it's important to understand that there were some extremely bad people living in Fort Sine, as there are in any big city, in any in any in any country, at any time. Um, some extremely bad people. Um, that, uh, most of the population uh, were not were not uh, in, in in that group, but um, there were some truly terrible stories. Um, uh, uh, one survivor, I, I read her account because she was no longer alive. Um, she was forced to abandon her young son in order to save her daughter. And uh, she remained absolutely convinced that the son um, was still alive and she spent the rest of her life uh, trying trying to find him. Could you go back to that previous uh, photograph? Yes, yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, uh, you can see that people were chalking messages on the ruins in case others came to look for them. And you can see here that the top comment is that everyone was alive in this particular um, uh, location. So quite an interesting photograph. Um, poor old uh, Adolf Katz, uh, the banker. He he didn't he, he got away with it in the sense that his family and he were uh, were okay. Um, but he ended up sitting in his garden at three a.m. Uh, on a sofa, <laughs> and uh, his house had um, been burnt down by uh, a phosphorus uh, bomb. So he didn't get away with it in that sense. I ought to mention um, Captain Ted Swales. Uh, he's uh, South African. Uh, he was the master bomber on the raid, and um, he won a posthumous uh, VC um, uh, this particular evening. Uh, his aircraft was attacked twice by a night fighter during the raid, and uh, he carried on controlling the raid uh, despite that fact. And then he, re re uh, he turned for home. But unfortunately, um, he started to lose control of the aircraft and uh, he had to tell the crew to jump. Um, but he had no chance himself to, 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 to get out and uh, sadly, uh, sadly he died uh, when, the, when the aircraft went in. This is a very important photograph. Um, I'm not quite sort of ready to talk about it, but. Um, it, uh, uh, this particular photograph shows uh, the crew that were, uh, were murdered in uh, a village very close to Fort Sign three weeks after the raid. But perhaps we can come back to that. We we'll come back to that in a minute if you want. I mean, let's talk. Let's let's talk about the um. Let's let's talk about the the civilian in, in aspect again, and, and and I'll find some appropriate slides. So, because yeah, yeah the, what. What what was it like in that in that town for the next? Few, yeah, there's families searching for each other. But you know, when you went there, and when well, for a start, what was it like when you went and spoke to people from there? Were they, did they welcome you? Did, how how did they receive you as a Brit going to talk about this? Well, generally speaking, very good. I mean, my German certainly isn't up to interviewing people, but <clears throat> I found a researcher, who uh, a PhD student, who uh, worked with me. He introduced me to his professor who is a specialist in uh, National Socialist uh, History, and uh, uh, he was quite useful uh, too. Tended to keep me on the straight and narrow, but he was extraordinarily uh, useful. Uh, but uh, I, I learned a lot. I learned, for example, that thousands of the victims had to be buried in mass graves, and hundreds were cremated um, on piles, um, simply through the fear of disease. Um, uh, there was a bomber command uh, raid report. It was raid report 846. And um, 846 described it as an outstanding attack. And the destruction as complete as any target uh, ever attack. attack. Uh, for people interested in statistics, uh, the 300 uh, old Lancasters, they dropped 727 tons of high explosive 820 tonnes of incendiaries, and the pillar of smoke over the city rose to 12,000 feet. Um, I want to speak a little more about um, the human side of it. It was a 13-year-old um, Bernard Malderer. 
Uh, he lived abroad, but um, I did talk to him, and uh, he also kindly um, gave me an account of his life. And uh, he recently lost his father when the rape um, took place, and now he was an orphan. He'd lost his mother, his brother, his sister, and Ray. And uh, he was left with his Hitler Youth uniform that he was wearing, uh, two spare pairs of pants and two pairs of socks, and uh, that was it. There were feeding stations um, set up in the city and they provided basic meals to um, 30,000 um, uh, survivors. Um, they issued um, a lot of tobacco and brandy, uh, I guess to bolster morale. And uh, every bombed out uh, individual got 100 uh, right marks. Um, Dieter Essig was a very young boy uh, at the time of the raid. Um, I interviewed him at some considerable length, and uh, he remembers being shocked by seeing the bodies of adults in the streets uh, shrunk to the size of uh, infants. Uh, and his mother, actually, and he, uh, spent the day after the raid. Uh, she was looking for her mother, and she turned over bodies and wiped the faces and tried to find, um, try to find her mother. Um, I can't remember whether or not she was successful, but probably not. Um, Hans Gerstung's father, I remember, um, the uh, young boy, um, the father was uh, was looking for his sister. Um, they knew where they were. They were in a cellar, uh, but it was too hot to go in. It took a week for the cellar to cook. And uh, when they went inside, there were seven tiny bodies inside. And two of them were locked in an embrace. And uh, when, when the bodies were prized apart, um, Anna, the sister was identified by, identified by a fragment of her, uh, her dress. Uh, meanwhile, the poor young Bernard Melderer was told that he wouldn't get any food unless he helped to deal with the dead bodies. So he spent 10 days uh, pushing bodies in a, to a town square in a wheelbarrow. And the farm carts then took them up to the cemetery. Um, to give you some idea of the scale of the catastrophe, the surrounding countryside had turned grey. A deposit of ash had settled up to 30 miles away from the city. And uh, uh, one girl um, pointed to a small black corpse and shouted out, that's all the remains of uh, my mother. And uh, a Nazi official was close by and he overheard her and he abused her for being unpatriotic. Um, there was obviously a terrible stench in, in the ruins, and there were no formal funerals. You could have individual um, uh, funerals, uh, but you had to dig the graves um, yourself. Um, so, pretty, uh, pretty awful. Wow. And and for the people of that part of Germany, did the whirlwind whirlwind raids continue? Well, the bombing continued. Um, Fort Sion was actually Bomber Command's last big area night raid, but uh, on March the 1st, um, the bombers uh, raided Mannheim in daylight. Uh, the next day, they uh, attacked Cologne. On March the 11th, uh, a thousand um, uh, British bombers made a last attack on Essen. Uh, March the 12th was the record breaker. There were 1,108 bombers uh, arrived uh, uh, over Dortmund and dropped nearly 5,000 tons of bombs. Um, March 16th, an attack on Nuremberg. Uh, March the 22nd, a raid on the relatively small city of Hildesheim. 70% uh, of the town was destroyed, and uh, the fire could be seen uh, in the air from uh, from 200 miles away. So uh, yeah, it continued, and it continued at uh, 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 quite, quite a pace. Uh, meanwhile, in Fordsheim, People were still searching for the bodies. And they laid them out in the city centre for identification. And um, <clears throat> there were a lot of wooden crosses that suddenly appeared in the ruins, and they marked the positions of where uh, missing people were known to be, but nobody had been able to dig them out. And the signs went up saying that looters and grumblers uh, would be shot. And the sign also explained that you would be forced to march to the cemetery if you'd be shot there to save uh, people the trouble of, uh, of carrying your, your, your body there. There are actually no records of people being shot in that period, but uh, 
the phrase looters and grumblers uh, perhaps tells you everything you need to know. Wow, yeah. Well, I think we ought to move on uh, yep. to, to the this this the murder of this allied crew because um we're we're yep. an hour and ten minutes in. So um and that's another another people have been very moved by the stories of the civilian impact, but here's now the other side again. Here's some of the uh, some of the the downside for the allies. Yeah, I, well, this, as I say, it was a, it was a B seventeen. It was a radio countermeasures uh, squadron, and um, the, um, the the captain of the aircraft was a guy called Johnny Wynn, and uh, the aircraft was hit, and um, he told the crew to abandon. Um, strangely, uh, he managed to limp home, flying the aircraft alone. The aircraft was empty apart from him, and but the others had jumped, and seven had captured as as one group and um they were they were marched through the ruins of fort simon pelted with rocks and then they were held in the cellar of a school uh, in a nearby village you've got a picture of that somewhere i actually went to the school and took pictures that's it they were held in, in this room uh, overnight uh, meanwhile uh, a gentleman called hans Kanan, who was the top nazi in fort simon decided that they would be executed. So he called together a small group of 16 year old um, Hitler youth leaders and um, briefed them to kill the uh, airmen. And he ordered them to do it in civilian dress and pretend that it was spontaneous, uh, an expression of the people's fury against the air gangsters. Uh, that's Hans Kman. That's his prison photograph, and the guy on the right is one of the 16-year-olds that did the shoot. And um, uh, to explain uh, what happened, they were held in that school cellar, and uh, the idea was to shoot them in that room. And uh, the mayor of, um, <coughs> excuse me, the mayor of the village of Huckenfeld uh, said that he couldn't accept that they'd be shot in the school, so he suggested they be taken to the cemetery to be shot. Um, yeah, incidentally, um, uh, I think this was a Saturday night, and at that point, he then returned to the wedding party he was attending. That's how concerned he was. Wow. Uh, the war crime. Uh, anyway, it was getting dark when they were led out, and three of the seven made a break for it, and um, uh, the other four were shot in the churchyard, and their bodies were left on the ground. Um, uh, uh, the following day, a Sunday, um, the congregation passed by the bodies on the way into church for a confirmation uh, service. Uh, so uh, later, if you go back to that previous um, uh, uh, drawing, it's a rough sketch of uh, the next crime that took place. Uh, one of the escapees was recaptured and he was held um, in another village nearby called uh, Ilfeisenstein. And uh, basically, he was held, then taken out and uh, taken along the road and um, beaten by uh, the villagers, including um, children as young as 11. And then a uh, 16-year-old um, Hitler youth uh, leader um, put a bullet in his head. Um, uh, then he was dumped half buried uh, in a nearby quarry, which is where his body was eventually uh, found. There were three war crimes trials. Um, 27 people were accused. Um, uh, Hans Knan, who also tried to um, get the uh, the Hitler youth to um, kill the other two, um, the, the two su who survived, he was hanged along with uh, three others. Uh, the five uh, Hitler youth uh, murderers, including uh, this chap on the right hand side, they got five to 15 years, um, but they were all released in early 1949. Um, they were all um, dead by the time I actually uh, got to work on this story. <clears throat> but I did interview somebody who um, had been at a school um, where this chap on the right um, used to drive the school bus for them. Uh, uh, apparently, he never showed any remorse for, for, for having Wow. <coughs> and uh, presumably at the trial, Fort Syme came up as, as, as part of the motivation for this, I assume? Well, that was the whole point, because it was, it was part of a wider scheme for a, a, a certain type of uh, Nazi uh, leader who um, um, 
uh, um, this was just one of a number of instances of air crew uh, being murdered, but that was the whole point. Um, the, the raid was used as an ex excuse for murdering uh, uh, the, these guys um, when, when, it, when in fact it wasn't a spontaneous outburst of fury of the raid. Uh, it was a cold and clinical um, uh, murder uh, dressed up as a spontaneous expression of rage. And um, you can see here um, some memorials uh, to the, the guys. Um, they were eventually uh, identified. They managed to identify them through the uh, laundry marks on, the, on, on, on their uniforms, but it was a very big effort to finally be able uh, to do that. So, um, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, if you keep this uh, photograph here, uh, uh, it's quite, quite interesting. Um, the, the French colonial troops occupied Fort Forsyth. Uh, they were uh, mostly Moroccans. Uh, they committed over 1,000 rapes in the Baden um, the area, the towns and villages of Baden. And uh, a house in Fort Sine, um, that I took photographs of uh, became, uh, at least for a time, an abortion clinic. Um, the fighting was um, fairly sporadic, um, uh, but um, <clears throat> this young gentleman here was actually an SS trooper, and uh, he fulfilled every schoolboy's dream. Uh, he helped range the guns of a building that was occupied by the French. Uh, it was, in fact, his former high school. Um, and uh, when it was all over, um, he found an obliging doctor and had his SS tattoo surgically uh, removed. Um, uh, ironically, the abortion clinic by this time was now guarded by French troops. <laughs> Can't make sense. And the French colonials were great thieves and they were also quite violent when they uh, had a drink in them. And it was a great relief when the Americans took over. And when the Americans took over, they appointed the banker Adolf Katz as the, uh, as the first mayor of uh, liberated um, Fordsight. And uh, he wrote the speech and uh, he made it clear in the speech that actually, even though they were now occupied, they were more free than they had been for many, many years under the Nazi uh, regime. And that's a, just, just to jump in there, that's, that's <coughs> yeah. worth, um, worth mentioning. Well, that, yeah, but, yeah, that's the abortion clinic. Yeah. yeah that, it, the, the the mayor this is this is a city that has been almost totally destroyed by allied bombing that is considered by some people war crimes dresden that whole thing but the mayor who had been you know the, the first post-war mayor or the post-liberation mayor <coughs> is saying that they are freer now than they've ever been i think that's the kind of quote that needs to be taken and used when we're looking at this you know he, he this is a guy who's seeing that the, the, the regime they were under was horrific. So too was the bombing raid, but they now got their freedom. And I think that's an important, important line yeah. there. Yeah, I mean, he actually uh, wrote in his um, diary that people under the Nazi regime had stopped being human beings and had become um, machines. But of course, a couple of months previously, if anybody had seen that remark, that would have cost him his head. Yeah. So, um, but some eyes were opened. I mean, the young guy, um, Gerd Fleet, the, uh, uh, the, the one that was dressed up in the uh, traditional um, dress that we looked at uh, recently, yes, him, okay. Um, he was a, a, a remarkable guy because he'd grown up and known nothing but National Socialism for the entire aware part of his, his, his life. And when he was exposed to political ideas uh, other than National Socialism, he became a liberal. Wow. He had a chance. Yeah. He had a chance. So I suppose one of the things that I learned from writing this book is that when you see a person, there's more than one person there. You can be a person of a particular type at one point of your life, somebody quite different in middle, in middle years and somebody totally different in, in, in old age. I mean, not just in physicality, but you're, your attitude, your persona, the, the way you look at life, I found that very, very interesting. Well, it's that bigger subject without going into philosoph philosophical talk about no one, well, very few people are truly good or truly evil. They're, they are they are human beings reacting to situations and, and – 
you know, the, the, and and talking even about in the broad terms about the bombing of Germany. It's neither evil or good. It's neither good or bad. It's 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 a big, complicated subject that needs nuance to understand it. And the war effort, as we explained at the beginning, it, it was total war. Let's defeat the Germans, and we can and we can we can accept that, and we can also feel sympathetic towards German civilians who are who are killed in horrible ways and who've lost their, their, their all of those thoughts can be going on in our head at the same time and i think it's important to understand that nuance but you know when fort Syme is now is rebuilt now so what what what's the legacy of the city there what how do they remember these events when you when you were writing your book and visiting it well again it's a bit of a mixed bag i mean first of all they um, built huge machines that crushed rubble and uh, mixed it with concrete they re rebuilt a city which I think it's fair to say wouldn't win any um, architectural merit award um, as such, um, but it's a it is a modern uh, concrete city um, uh, built built for the car. Um, how is it today? Well, uh, every um, uh, 23rd of February um, there's a um, civic ceremony uh, of remembrance at the cemetery. In the evening, uh, 1945. Uh, this, this, the picture you're looking at there are the mass grave areas in the uh, uh, in the cemetery. Um, there are seven thousand two hundred bodies in uh, in those pits. Um, anyway, uh, at 1945, in the evening of the 23rd of February, all the city's uh, church bells ring, uh, and that marks the point where the flares burst uh, over the city. Um, during the day. Um, uh, unfortunately, the neo-Nazis um, across Germany have a habit of gathering every year in cities that were subjected to very heavy raids, and uh, they gather in those cities uh, every year, uh, in Dresden, in Hamburg, and certainly in Fortside. And uh, I was there on the 23rd of February. We had a public reading of the uh, book, um, The Neo-Nazis, uh, a small group of them arrived in the meeting, um, and uh, one of them asked me, was the bombing of Fortsheim a war crime? And uh, uh, the answer to that is really easy. Um, the answer is that 362 Lancasters wouldn't have appeared over Fortsheim, but for Hitler and uh, his desire for total war, it wouldn't have happened. And I would submit that the victims of that air raid and the 60 million other people who lost their life uh, in, uh, in, in the Second World War, um, uh, the vast majority of those victims uh, belong to Hitler. That's, that, that's my view. But it is a sad thing. And I mean, every year the police struggle to control the neo-Nazis when they come into the city and they corral them on, on a hilltop uh, in, 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 within the city. And the... Um, the left and centre parties, they organise a big protest march uh, through the city. It involves several thousand people. And if they get the chance, uh, uh, they do battle together. Um, uh, five or six years ago, uh, the battle got quite um, serious and they used water cannon and uh, people went to hospital and all the rest of it. So it's a sad thing, really, because in the 1930s, there was a lot of street violence in Fortnite. And on one day of the year, in the 21st century, there's also a lot of street violence uh, in Fortside, and this is the police that's been keeping them apart. So, um, I think that's a very, uh, a very sad thing to have to. Yeah. Have to report. So we just we'll, we'll round things off fairly soon. But Sean sure. Brown uh, asked the question: So, what impact did the raid have on the rail network? Obviously, we know much of the city was destroyed, but what about the rail, the rail side of things? Well, the, the rail net network was still functioning, and the uh, photo reconnaissance uh, uh, photographs um, uh, uh, prove that. But um, did it make a material difference to um, the advance of the Americans and the French colonials? Uh, I suspect not. And um, if you want to be even handed, you have to recognize the fact that uh, there was definitely um, a desire as part of the architecture of the um, strategic bombing uh, campaign to bring home to the German people uh, the terrible cost to them 
of um, an aggressive war. That was that was part of the war aim of the strategic mm. um, bombing campaign. It says it says as much in the introduction to the United States Air Force strategic bombing survey. So it's there in black and white. There yeah. is and definitely an element uh, of that. Um, but the legacy lives on. If you walk around Fort Sam today, um, there are lots of engraved metal plaques showing you the, the city vistas as they would have looked before February the 23rd, um, uh, 1945. Equally, for balance, you have to look at the Stoppelstein. I, I don't know if you've ever heard of these, but they are the little brass bricks that are set in the pavement outside the homes of people who were murdered by the Nazis. Yeah. Not, not, not just Jewish people, but people like um, uh, people who had disabilities and suffered under the T4 program, and uh, uh, people like um, Jehovah's Witnesses. In fact, the Nazis hated Jehovah's Witnesses more than they hated Jews. They yeah. truly truly hated them so um you have to balance one against the other very very difficult no i agree and i mean you know you i think we know your conclusions you know ultimately if there is a war criminal here it's hitler is at the top of the food chain here hitler started the war hitler was the aggressive one hitler and the third right were the ones who tried to enslave peoples try to murder entire peoples and religions and 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 disable them all that and Yes, the events of these this raid were devastating. Maybe it didn't have the impact on the war, the the ending the war any quicker. But the yeah, trying to blame the RAF and accuse them of war crimes, I personally don't. I, I don't go hold much with that. Um, but it, it anyway. It, during your research, because you you wrote the book some time ago. Now we're all getting older all the time, and there's. Uh, do your feelings about this ever change? Do you obviously you're sympathetic towards the Germans or sympathetic towards the air crews? You, you know, do you do you do you, have you ever sort of changed your mind on this subject at all? The one thing that I find disturbing, and I have to be very careful how I try and express this, but there is um, there is a real difficulty talking about this period of history in Germany. And it's not for the reason that you might think. Um, today in Britain, there's political correctness and um, the woke um, generation and controversies surrounding um, gender and so on and so forth. Um, I found in Germany, there's a real reluctance to deal with important evidence purely because the subject is sensitive. I'll give you one quick example. I got a diary of a German house who complained uh, in her diary about the French colonials uh, 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 invading uh, uh, her city. And, um, uh, you know, they were from um, North Africa and she made some fairly uh, politically unacceptable today remarks uh, 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 about the truth. Uh, but I was strongly urged to take that material out of the book because it was politically unacceptable today. Uh, I, frankly, as a historian, I don't understand that. I, I mean, you have to face the facts. And if you can talk about people being burned to death, if you can talk about the horrors of total war, you should be able to talk about the prejudices that were normal in those days um, in, in a fair and free manner without self-editing. Yeah. I think that's completely wrong. It's perhaps not the sort of subject you expected me to expected me to respond with. Well, no, it's, I mean, very, I think, it's a very I think, important thing. I think you're absolutely right. I think if 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 we're going to discuss the firebombing of Germany, then we need to discuss it from all the angles. The angles of what was happening in Germany before, what was happening under the Third Reich, how was the how are we trying to end the war, what was happening to their Jews there, what was it a legitimate target. The problem is, and we could we end up talking about this for hours, is people want to only talk about the certain bits that they that fit their agenda. They want to talk about the war crime aspect, what, whatever. You know, and yeah. I like the fact that over tonight's show, we've talked about war crimes against you know, legitimate murders of an Allied air crew. We've talked about the civilian casualties in 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 the city. We've talked about the fact it isn't even Harris behind. We've talked about it in a complex way. We've been adult about it, I think is what I'm saying. is We've, yeah. we've looked at this complex issue and we've addressed everything. 
Yeah, and I think there's one thing to remember. Um, there is a term in um, in Germany, um, basically it translates to uh, civil courage, and um, it refers to ordinary people who had enough guts and courage to stand up um, for what was right uh, in probably one of the most evil regimes that's ever existed on earth, and uh, we shouldn't forget them. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think on that note, that's a perfect way to end this discussion. We, we there's lots more rabbit holes we could have gone down on this, and there's more we could. There's there's Harris is an in, is worth discussing for entire show at some point. But we've done we've done ninety minutes, and I think it's been a really uh, it, it, incredible listening to you. your balanced, nuanced view of this from the Allied side, from the German side has been has been really really um enlightening so thank you very much i'll just say goodbye to the folks i'll come back and say goodbye to you in a second so so folks we have one more show in strategic bombing week which is tomorrow night we're talking about the b-29s over the pacific with the nw toll then it's um land army show uh saturday night and then next week we begin the build up to d-day week with lots of shows about um the training for D-Day, what was going on in terms of mine sweeping, radar and stations, those kind of things that's coming up. And I've been busy scheduling more shows. Medics week is up on YouTube now in June. The leadership week is up in June and I'm working on the weeks in, in July as well. So there's lots and lots coming up in the, in the next few weeks and months. I've been very busy there doing that for you. So please, as usual, check out the links below, check out and maybe consider becoming a patron uh, the link to tony's book is below there check us out on twitter all the usual things in the descriptions below but right now it remains for me to say thank you very much tony wedding for joining us and yep. again i'll hold up the copy of the book there it's definitely worth getting the bombing bombing journey the final phase um and all the things tony talked about and a lot more from the civilian side is all in the book there so i, I urge you to go and get that um and that was great so um yeah, we, we did 90 minutes today. That was good. So I will I will welcome you back anytime and talk about another subject. And don't forget to check out Tony's Chindit show with us. That was um that was worth watching as well. Because I love the emotional level you bring to these discussions. It's not just a clinical look at air power in terms of bombs. It's a it's a look at uh, human the human spirit. Yeah. So, it's all about people. Thank you very all much. All about people, exactly. So thank you very much, folks. I will see you all again tomorrow with Ian W. Tov. As for now, I'm going to go and have a, uh, an evening of maybe watch a bit of television myself. So thank you, thank you for watching, everybody. I will see you all again tomorrow. Thanks. Good night.